die volgende aangeleerd het wat ons gaan aanspreken is een gespreksgeleentheid uh, ten opzichte van COVID-19. Hey, die verbruikersverdrag van Anner, gedrag van Anner, wat betekent het voor boeren in die landbouw, plaatselijk en internationaal? En Brandon de Kok van Y5 gaan ons toespreken hier. Ik wil graag net voor u zijn CV voeren. Brandon's career has been one of uh, being a companion of games, as he says. Playing around in industries as diverse as hospitality, music and art, to inventing, conferencing, research and publishing. He's a career writer, photographer and public speaker, and was editor of the Complete Golfer magazine for eight years before taking up the position of group creative and content director for Ramas, Ramas, Ramsey Media, uh, Gateway C Car, etc., where he left in a half in 2012 because they wouldn't listen. Together with his wife Nikki, he is also an internationally published award winning cookbook author. He brings all the experience to bear in the context of consumer based, consumer focused marketing and communications consultancy called Y5. Insights where together with his business partner Stuart Love, he, look, he books for the stories, he looks for the stories in the numbers and the tries to present them like great rock songs. It's our opportunity to listen to, to Brandon. Uh, I think it's going to be very insightful. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Brandon. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, good morning. Good morning, Maureen. Um, how's it? I'm down in Cape Town. And uh, just want to start off by saying, guys, it's a, it's a privilege to be here. Um, I think uh, we sit at an interesting time in uh, South Africa where agriculture and farming and in general, obviously, these are, these are, we, we, it feels like we're at, at tipping points the whole time in our lives. Um, and moments like this, when uh, the, the community can come together and try and find solutions, try and find common solutions. Something like the Agri SA Congress, I think, is a it's a vital moment, and it's a it's a privilege to be a, to be able to play a, a very small little part um, in it. So thank you, thank you for having me. Um, so how can we help, or how can I help you today? Well, we're in the business of consumer insights. So consumer insights is a very fancy way of, of saying. We try to uh, get people to understand uh, what the South African consumer is like. And every year we send out uh, millions of invitations and we get about 30,000 South Africans to answer a whole bunch of questions about what they like, what they don't like, what they buy, what they don't buy, what they eat, what they drink, um, a whole bunch of questions to try and, and understand the South African consumer. And we then take those insights and we go to uh, back to South African businesses and companies. And we try to tell them a little bit about what's going on in, in consumers' minds. Because most companies and most businesses know a lot about what they sell, but they don't really know much about the people that they're selling things to. So that's our, our job. And obviously right now, the big question on everybody's minds is, you know, what is the effect of COVID? Uh, how has the lockdown and more importantly the actions that government has taken economically all around the world and in south africa what what effect has has COVID had so i'm going to uh, spoil the plot from the beginning and say first of all um, it is way way too early right now to actually uh, make guesses as to what the real effect of, of this is, is going to be on the consumer um, i've got some thoughts that I'll share with you in, in this presentation about where we think things are heading. But anybody who tries to pretend they know what's happened already is, is kidding themselves. Uh, these effects are only really going to show much later on. But what we can, what I can tell you for absolute sure is that we're of the opinion that you need to frame this whole thing in the right way. Um, COVID didn't create anything. Uh, that is not the, the right, you know, COVID has not created anything. Uh, it's a little bit like I, um, the example of people getting the, the, the context of things wrong. We had a, a chat with somebody the other day in, in Germany and, and she took one look at me and she said, she said, look at what's happened to you. you. You're like all the other, these other men who've used this as an excuse to grow your hair and grow your beard. And I went, it's crazy. Uh, 
I didn't grow it. It grows. You know, like you don't grow a beard. This is actually what I look like. For the first time in 20 years, my wife actually knows what I look like. So we need to frame things correctly. Otherwise, you know, the, the questions sort of, the questions and the answers get pretty murky. So with COVID, here's all that COVID has really done. COVID hasn't created anything. It has simply um, shown and exposed existing weaknesses. You know, on a medical level, they talk about comorbidities. So, you know, if you have diabetes, if you are overweight, you've got more chance of succumbing, of being very vulnerable. So COVID didn't create those. It's simply taking advantage of those opportunities. And what we've been working on as a, a sort of a theory and a framework from the beginning of COVID and of lockdown was to try and understand how that comorbidity issue works with brands and industries and societies and social groups. I don't think it's a mistake that the Black Lives Matter issue boiled over in America and then around the world. I don't think that the strikes that are happening around the world are a coincidence. I think COVID has exacerbated uh, pre-existing conditions. So exacerbated meaning it has made a, a pre-existing bad situation even worse. So that's the, the context. And it, if we're trying to work out what uh, questions to ask here or how, to, how we should sort of look and understand um, South Africa, we, we need to start with, with the question um, that is my first slide. What does what does South Africa, you know, really look like? And there are many ways of uh, looking at South Africa. Uh, you can look at it as a map. Uh, you can look at it. Uh, I'm sure you guys look often look at rainfall maps. I mean, hope you are with the droughts that are going on. Um, this is the way that we look at South Africa. Um, you know, the landscape of South Africa, when it, for us, is is very interesting when you talk about income. Because when you talk about who's earning the money and who's spending the money, you start realizing who holds sort of the, 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 the consumer power in South Africa. This is the South African income pyramid. So right now, South Africa earns about 2.7 trillion rand a year. And what this pyramid shows is the breakdown of households and where the households sit um, in this, this, this income pyramid. So, the first thing that you can see is that obviously this is what the classic, uh, what you're looking at is, is the GDP coefficient. When people talk about inequality, this is what we're talking about. The bottom 70% of all adults in this country live in households earning under 10,000 Rand a month. Bottom 70%, so seven out of 10 South Africans. Um, it's a lot, it's 28 million people, it's close to 30 million people this year by, by estimates. Then in the middle, you've got this, this amazing middle class, um, it's grown massively in the last 10 years. Uh, it's about 9 million people. And they live in what we call the middle class, so between 10 and 40. And then right at the top, you've got this tiny little group of 5%, only 5% of South Africans who live in households earning 40,000 rand a month or more. It's not a lot of people. When you add the top two triangles together, you get 30% of our population live in what we call middle class in up South Africa. Uh, it's about 12 million South Africans. And what's important, obviously, is that the overwhelming majority of those, the middle class and up in South Africa, are a previously disadvantaged group. This is not, uh, you know, there are only, I think, uh, there are four and a half million white people left in this country. Um, there are only two million of them who have jobs. Um, what you're looking at at the top of the triangle is the sort of, is the great untold story of this, of this country. It's, it's a massive success story in the growth and diversity of the middle class and the top end. What we do at BrandMap and the, the work we do is to try and understand these two top pieces of the triangle because, um, as my next slide will show you, uh, there, is a, um, there is a huge discrepancy in the amount of money that these people earn. So that bottom 70% earn about 400 uh, billion rand a year. The middle class earn 900 and that top 5% earns more than 50% of all the income in this country. That means that they not only earn it, but they spend it. So we believe that this top end of the triangle is, is massively, massively important. Um, apart from anything, on a social and on a, on a sort of a power and influence level, it's those people who are going to create the businesses and create the opportunities that will drag the rest of, of that 70%, hopefully, higher and higher up the triangle. That's a, it's a, a, 
it's, it's worth obsessing about that top 30% and making sure that everything that works there works as well as it can. Because, as my next slide shows you, uh, there is a, a very huge implication for the country. So you might have read some of this stuff before. Um, I can only show it to you as a fact, as the closest thing to a fact uh, that I can find from government. Every year, the Treasury Department um, has to uh, issue a, uh, a report to Parliament. So the SARS get up at the beginning of the year and they tell everybody what they think will happen. And then at the end of the year, the Treasury Department stands up and tells us all what actually happened. And you can go and find this chart for yourself. Effectively, all it does, don't worry about the actual numbers. I just put it there to prove to you that I'm not making this up. Um, what that chart shows you is that there are about 7.6 million South Africans who actually pay tax in this country. So out of the 40 million adults, only 7.6 million pay any tax. But crucially, when you look at the, the top 2 million people who, are, who have jobs in this country, they're paying 82% of all the personal tax. And personal tax is the biggest slice of the tax pie. So we believe these are massively, massively important people, and it's the basis of, of everything that I can show you today. I can't really talk about the bottom of that pyramid. Um, obviously, these are, uh, there are quite a lot of those people who are on social grants, somewhere between 12 and 15 million of them. There are 12 million of those people who go to bed hungry every night. Um, and somebody needs to try and help them, and it's only going to be helped if that top part of the triangle uh, is robust and active and economically active. And I really do believe that, you know, that it's, it's important that we understand that picture of this country. So that's the first story, the first uh, picture of South Africa. My next slide will show you a slightly different map of South Africa. So every year, the Stats SA guys come out with the media population estimates. The population of this country, as you know, has, has increased and increased. We're on about 25 to 3% a year. Um, and that means that every single year, there are just increasingly more people that um, you and, and your members need to feed. You know, um, we, we definitely need to be making more food, not less, because there are more people, uh, not fewer people. And here, for me, is one of the most fascinating aspects of uh, South African society. We are one of the youngest countries in the world. What this map and this chart shows you is they've simply taken, um, a, it's a graphic representation where each bar on that chart represents an age group, an individual age group starting from naught and going up to 70, whatever. And they've mapped the, the actual number of people in each group. So what you can see is that the number of people 79 and older is very, very tiny. The number of children um, of age sort of 10, 11 is massively high. And then you've got another peak at 29 to 30 years old. So there are more people who are 30 years old in South Africa than any other age category. Um, what does this mean? Well, imagine that we had a, a totally stable society where where the age groups were almost perfectly aligned. It, it, I, I look at this almost like the ocean or as a, as a, a sort of a, a lake uh, top. That if you had a, if, if everything was flat, um, so you had the same amount of people dying as were being born and, if, and your population was pretty flat, um, things would be quite calm, uh, uh, you know, calm and gentle. Um, if things are the, the reverse way around, if you've got no young people um, being born, so if the left-hand side of that chart was a big dip, then you've got a, almost like a backwash effect. This is what's happening in places like Japan and Norway and places where there's just this massively aging population. In South Africa, we have a different thing. We have this massive youth wave and it looks like this wave that's going to kind of just overwhelm everything else. And in fact, that process has already started. Um, so we call it the youthification of South Africa and it has a massive impact on the consumer market because it means that that our consumers, the vast majority of our consumers, are just a hell of a lot younger than in many other countries. If you flip to the next slide, um, I'll try and quantify that for you. Um, you know, 64 percent of the South African population is under 35. It's it's massive. If you compare that to other countries like America, the UK, and Italy, you suddenly see why age was such an issue with coronavirus. So we specifically believe that that countries like Italy were hugely vulnerable 
because of a very, very old population. And maybe it's one of the saving graces in South Africa is that we have a, a completely different shape. What does this mean? Well, it's super important because, because the difference between a young society and an old society is that young societies, young people eat more, drink more, uh, buy more clothes, do more, they spend more, they are more economically active. Old people eat less, drink less, and do less. It's just a fact of life. And it's one of the reasons why people like Clem Sunter and some of the, the great thinkers um, in terms of socioeconomics will show you that figure for America and say that's why the dollar is so strong. The dollar is strong not because of policies and uh, anything that um, <clears throat> presidents of America may try to do or not do. Its, its economy is based on the idea that they're an incredibly young society. That 7% shift is ma massively meaningful. And we in this country have an opportunity to leverage that young population. If we can get it right and if we can create the right opportunities, we have a massive group of young people who are qualified, intelligent, eager, and ready to live life. And if we can somehow just leverage them and motivate them, boy, we're on a, on a good wicket. So what, is the, what does this mean as a sort of a global trend? Well, my next slide is a, is a, a slightly controversial young lady. Um, you might recognize her. Uh, Greta Thornburg. When, when this whole thing happened where this young lady, for those of you who, who don't know, um, you know, she was very outspoken, um, a massive social media campaign, kind of global awareness for the environment, speaking as a young person and making the argument that she is, is going to be growing up in a world that we, the older generation, have created for her. And that's, that's not fair. She wants more of a say in it. I call it the Thunberg effect because I think that if you take what I've just shown you and you understand that the relative impact of young people on the world now compared to what it was in previous generations is just far, far greater. Young people do have the opportunity to change the world um, in, their, in their own way. Uh, it's, a, it's a very different world we live in. And these children, we now have a generation, remember, who are going to grow up being the only example in the entire natural history of the world of being the young people in a species that has put itself at risk by protecting the old and the weak. Um, it's it's, it's going to be interesting to see how those kind of thoughts influence how young people grow up. But don't underestimate the effect of youth in this country. And, and all we've got to do is, is find a way of, of mobilizing them. So my first sort of question for you today is, as I have on the next slide, is uh, a simple thought, you know. Um, wouldn't it be amazing if we could mobilize and motivate young people in this country to reconnect with the land, to reconnect with the food supply chain and with food security as a concept and actually get them interested? Uh, if there's any marketing campaign, I would encourage all of you to support. It would be to try and get young people connected back to food. I don't really know how we're going to do it, especially in a country where, you know, uh, fast food and, and Americanized food is seen as a, a sort of an aspirational thing. You know, somebody would, uh, a, a McDonald's burger is far more impressive than a, a head of cabbage, you know, or a head of spinach. Um, but boy, if we could motivate these young people, you know, um, I remember the day when I read that, that statistic about 30% of food, um, you know, not finding its way from your hard work to, to the tables. When, if we're going to lose 30%, man, the governments of the world should really be doing something about that. And if young people could just find out about that rather than taking pictures of themselves in bikinis, um, it, 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 it might change the world, you know. So that's the power of, the power of youth. Um, it is, this youth thing is definitely, it's what we call a trend. But, but uh, as I said, my next slide, just be, be wary of, um, of, of trends. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, we've got to be wary of, of, of trends. So trends are, um, there's a lot of people who work in, in trends. Trends are, again, just a fancy way of saying, we know what happened before and we can see what's happening now. So where do we think this thing's going to go? But we get sort of a bit messed up in this world about trends versus fads. You know, fads are just pit stops along the way. Um, trends are general directions. So I'll give you a classic example of one of my favorite um, uh, bad examples of this that has quite a big impact potentially on some of you. You may have heard about this, this vegan trend. 
So all over the, the news for the last year, maybe year and a half, is this idea that veganism is the next big trend. Um, as you can see, I'm not a, a vegan. <clears throat> um, I'm afraid I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a meat eater, I'm an omnivore. Um, but it worried me that, that this obsession with veganism was, was asking the wrong question. So we set out in brand map this year to try and, and prove something. And uh, my next slide shows you a simple question that we ask. Um, next slide, please. Um, we asked the question, um, a very simple question, very non-committal, right? Um, which of these things are you likely to do in the near future? And we just put a, a fairly random bunch of things in this. These are all behavioral. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's good that 60% almost of people want to cut down on sugar. We've got some fairly high percentages of people saying, I want to improve my recycling and stuff like that, which is good. Almost 20% of people thinking that they drink too much. Um, uh, boy, I wonder how they fared during, uh, during lockdown. Anyway, so we asked a bunch of these questions, and, but what's missing from the slide is on my next slide, because we asked um, a very, very simple, uh, two very simple questions. Uh, are, do you think that you're likely to become a vegan? Do you think you'd like to become a vegetarian? Or do you think you're likely to be um, trying to, to eat less meat? And right there, you've got a great example of putting something into context, because Veganism clearly is not the trend. The trend is a long-term trend of people wanting to eat a little bit more consciously, of wanting to eat a little bit better. In fact, the trend is that they want to eat less meat, not stop eating meat. Um, a tiny percentage of people, 6% said vegetarian, and the 4% who said vegans all sit inside the 6% who said vegetarians. So around about 6% of people contemplating a vegan or vegetarian diet. Clearly, flexitarianism is, is the next um, big food trend. Uh, this will have an impact on us, I think, especially um, maybe not at the lower end of the market where people can't really afford to make these choices, but certainly at the top end of the market, I think we're going to see some fairly big changes in the next maybe five to ten years about people's eating habits, um, especially if thanks to drought and um, Chinese export policies, uh, things like the price of beef start skyrocketing. Um, I think you may well see this number go, go up and up. But the trend quite clearly is just less meat, not no meat. Um, and that's a much better way of looking at the world if you're trying to strategize and work out you know, what to do to, to survive and thrive. So this flexitarianism, my next slide um, asks the, uh, the simple question, what does that flexitarianism mean? What are the big global trends that we see? Um, and it clearly is going to affect everything, all the way down to the very bottom of the, of the food chain, you know, the, the, the basis of society. What do we eat and what do we drink and how do we survive? Um, your business. Um, this all comes down to this idea of a conscious consumer. You may, if you read any global trends, you'll see this word come up over and over, the conscious consumer. So conscious consumerism is kind of interesting. Um, my next slide will show you a picture of, of a, a very simple example of how conscious consumerism has had a direct effect on the supply chain in this country. Almost 42% of people in our survey say that they regularly go and visit uh, food markets. Um, so this is this food market thing that's, that's kind of, it's quite trendy and it's kind of hipstery. Um, but, but what it really is, is it's, it's hyper-local. Now, obviously, this all collapsed completely during COVID. Uh, during lockdown, these markets were not allowed to open. I have it on, I, I spoke to the guys at the, at the Aranza City Farm in Cape Town's Granger Bay, and they said that they're almost back up to the level that they were pre-COVID, um, and they've only been open for just on a month. Um, people are absolutely loving this idea of tapping into their, what they consider to be conscious consumerism. It's words like authentic and natural and local and committed. Again, what's important about this is, I realize we're only talking about the very top of the triangle, but if you can imagine that, that those are the people who are really gonna influence, they're sort of pulling the whole economy and everything else will follow them. So those trends that, that happen at the top end of the market are kind of interesting to understand, especially if you're playing in the, in the realm of kind of um, uh, what I call top-end goods or you know, high-end goods. 
this concept of, of conscious consumerism is playing out all over the place. Some people are getting it right. Some people get it wrong. Um, my next slide has a, a story on it that I, I picked up, I think it was on September the 30th, so a couple of days ago, a week ago. I thought this was hilarious that, you know, in Ireland, Subway sandwiches, I mean, if, if any of you have been to America, you'll know Subway. Um, you know, they, they, there's huge implications of this because, because the bread that they use has, uh, or bread is tax free, obviously, in, in most places in the world. Um, but a definition of bread in, in Ireland is that it has to have less than 2.8 grams of sugar per loaf. And the Subway bread was sitting at somewhere like eight, between 8 and 10 grams. So it's been reclassified as a pastry. So a Subway is not a sandwich anymore. It's a pastry and it's taxed accordingly. So the prices of Subway sandwiches globally will go up by, you know, 25% unless they find a way of getting around it. So understanding that these, these conscious consumer ideas have real world implications, um, as Subway just found out, I think it's quite an important, uh, it's quite important to understand. This is a, a bit of a, a tipping point moment, perhaps, for some of these, these companies. They'll be looking at this going, wow, what are the implications for us? Which brings me to my, my next slide, my next point. Um, how, how do we spot tipping points? You know, what are we supposed to look out for um, in what we read and the discussions we have? And, you know, uh, it's a little bit like going, you know, at what stage do I have to worry about, about the weather? You know, how, how much do, do, does the weather have to change before we go, it's changed forever? Um, I remember when we were having the, the water crisis, which thank goodness in the Western Cape, we're, we're at hundred percent full again, but there was this, this moment where I think everybody went, wow, that's, that's the tipping point. You know, we've, if we don't make a difference now, it's, it's all going to go to hell. Um, and we did, we managed to, to spot the tipping point and get around it. So my next slide puts a, a, a an idea on the table. Um, next slide, please. Um, it puts a, an idea on the table, which is a little bit like the old idea of 80-20. I don't know if you know the 80-20 principle. It, it's a, a famous sort of marketing or behavioral model, which says that you generally get 80% of your result from 20% of your effort. So you need to work out what that 20% is and put more effort into it. I think a far more interesting principle has been laid bare by COVID and by what's happened in the world lately. And I'm calling it the 60-40 principle. So it sounds completely, uh, it almost sounds too simple, um, but, it, but it isn't. The idea is that a, a balance is obviously 50-50. And tipping points happen when 50-50 goes over the edge. But there's a, a moment in time where before you get to 50-50, something sits at 60-40, obviously. And if you can understand the 60-40 moment and see it before it happens, you'll start understanding where these things are gonna tip over the edge, and where they are maybe going to stay the same. So I call it the 60-40 principle. And from the beginning of COVID, um, as my next slide will show you, the most um, extraordinary thing happened. I was trying to track all these different stories from all over the world in all sorts of different ways. And the, the number of times that 60% or 40% came up was just absolutely extraordinary. Um, everything with, from the, the percentage of, of deaths attributed to diabetes as a comorbidity issue to unemployment rates to, you know, a, um, the, the, the degree to which things were over-reported to, I mean, just look at it. It's just this barrage of 60-40 moments. And I think that 60-40 is, is just, it's bear it in mind. If you're reading a newspaper or if you're listening to something on the radio and you hear that something's 60-40, um, take note because either it means that something is sitting at 40% and if it's going the wrong way, that's gonna hit a tipping point soon, or it means that it's at 60%, which either means it's recovering or it means that it's gone over the tipping point. Um, and we have so many instances of this in our data. If you go to the next slide, I'll show you a, a, a great example. Um, we, you, you, in, in my uh, biography that was kindly read out um, earlier, you might have noticed I was involved in magazines for, for many years. And we've always been very interested and worried about magazines, um, just as a, as a category. And we found out two years ago that 40% of South Africans had stopped buying magazines. 
the, earlier this year when we went field, we, we found that number had gone up to 46% of South Africans don't buy magazines anymore. That, that's just a, a warning sign. This thing's going the wrong way. And as my next slide will show you, um, we've seen the effects of this very, very quickly. Since the beginning of lockdown, we've lost three of the, of the biggest magazine publishers in this country basically closed doors. Massive titles from Cosmopolitan to Drum Magazine. Fortunately, Farmers Weekly is okay. Um, so this was a, a classic example. On our next slide, um, I'll show you that we've identified at least four different things that are going to fundamentally shift, we believe. So these are not specifics. These are in general. What are the, what are the big kind of shifts that, that COVID will bring a, a, along globally and specifically in South Africa? So the one at the top, obviously, the digital economy, obviously, you know, with everybody stuck at home, 65% of South Africans being urbanized, um, you can imagine that the digital economy has just gone through the roof. The essential economy talks about um, this idea that we're all going to return to, to not spending as much on frivolous things and spending stuff on, on what we think is important. Again, food being you know, at the top of that pile. The next one's relatively more important. It's this idea of the nest economy. You know, how has being at home influenced our behavior as, as consumers? Will we be going out as much ever again? Will we eat more at home, eat, have people around for dinner? The last one, though, is the most important. It's, it's a very key point I'd like to leave or, or hope you guys can, can leave this, this talk with is this idea of a caring economy. You know, I don't think that caregivers and nurses and doctors and people have ever been given so much love. And it, it worries me that farmers and the agricultural sector haven't been higher up in that hierarchy from the beginning of, of, uh, of lockdown. But I do think there's a unique opportunity to use this moment of consciousness to try and tell people more about the role that agriculture and farming plays in our lives and why in this new caring environment that we have, we should be giving a, a, a lot more emphasis to it. So let me just give you five quick uh, 60, 40 moments to, uh, to think about and show you how this plays out in the consumer world um, and some of which has, has quite a bearing on, on your guys' activities. So my first slide, talks about um, the 60-40 principle. Can we move slides, please? Um, the 60-40 principle at play when it comes to home ownership. So not land ownership. I'm not going to go anywhere near land ownership today. It's way too much of a hot potato. Um, I love that Nando's ad, the Mzanzipoli, the Monopoly ripoff. Um, home ownership is, in this country, it is a bit like, uh, like Monopoly. You know, it, it feels like very few people can actually afford um, to own a home anymore. And the people who own one tend to own more hotels and, and more properties. Um, this is going to be an interesting thing as it plays out in this country. I think that property and the property market is, is just uh, beautifully primed for some kind of massive overhaul and crisis within itself. Property just costs too much when only 42% of adults right now own their own home. The next slide is, uh, is kind of interesting as well. You know, um, it's a pity that only it's only 60%. We, we asked the question, what keeps you awake at night? And 60% and of adults say that, that crime is their biggest worry. Again, right now, I think if you took this uh, survey um, at the end of COVID, I think in some of the rural areas, this number would be absolutely massive. Uh, in the urban areas, it'll be, it would be interesting. You know, crime is down 40% in most urban, in most of the cities. Um, but the fact that, that the crime is a worry, again, plays into this idea of, I, I do believe that, that we as a society are ready for the right messaging, um, the right stories to be told, to tell us what we need to worry about and what we need to be concerned about. And, and there is an opportunity to do that. People are definitely uh, concerned more now about crime than they were. Um, my next slide is, is a, again, shows a, a, a level of care, right? So the question we ask is, how important is it for companies to give back to society? And, and this has changed radically in the last five years. If I go back five years, this number was sitting more like on the 40%. So we've reached a tipping point in this country about how important it is to consumers that companies give back appropriately. When I say companies, you might as well call it organizations, companies, brands, whatever. These people, consumers in this country, are, are highly attuned to the idea that 
that you, you've got to give back. And if you don't, just look at that percentage of people who say they'll actively work against you. It's almost one in five, you know, 16% of people. So there is a, a general feeling in this middle class and up, the top section of, of society in South Africa, that, that we need to be making changes. Yeah? My next slide talks about, um, on a similar uh, a vein, it talks about what these people believe is important. And by far, when we ask people which causes deserve the most support, these people who are highly educated people totally understand the value of education. Um, look how radical education is compared to something like food security, though. Only 12% of people ticked a box to say that they think food security is a cause worth supporting, worth you know, standing up and shouting for. That picture clearly needs to change quite radically. You know? um, and my, my final thought on education is just an idea for you that the reason why I believe education or we believe education is important is because not necessarily it teaches you about history or when things happened or didn't happen. Being educated allows you to anticipate the results of your actions. Education is all about if then. You as those of you who are active farmers will know all about if then, you know. Um, if you waste everything now, you've got nothing for the, for the, the lean years. Um, so we desperately need to support education and that's number one. And number two, we need to do something about that percentage of people who think that food security is, is something that needs to be supported. My next slide and, and my final parting thought for you, uh, by far the most important slide that I'll show you um, today. When we started at the beginning, I said, where, you know, what do we think is going to happen with COVID? That's the big question. It all is going to come down to a simple thing. How much money will anybody have left to even be a consumer? How many consumers will be affected negatively? So this question is, is how do you feel about your debts? And remember what I said, these are the people at the top of that triangle. They're paying 82% of the, of the taxes. A lot. This is where 100% of the taxes, sorry, comes from. We need these people to be active, part of, part of the economy and an active part. 40%, and this study came out before lockdown, 40% of these people said, I'm either nervous about my debts or I'm worried or my debts out of control. They are definitely debt stressed. And the crazy thing is, the first piece of research that I've seen came out about this uh, last week from Chance Union, who say that they think at the moment that 35% of South Africans may drop out of the middle class because of their debt, uh, the COVID-induced debt. So this is something to, to really to watch and worry about. When I say worry about, it's just understanding our ability to bounce back as an economy. Um, there's no point in sticking our heads in the sand and, and thinking that everything's magically going to you know, disappear and, and come right. So that's, a, that's the glass half full. So my next slide is my final slide. I, 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 uh, I saw the story I was wondering when I was putting this piece together. Why is it that we've got millions of people all over the world cheering for health workers every night and we don't have people, enough people cheering for the farmers? I mean, I know you, most of you live on places that are too far away to ever hear the cheering, but wouldn't that be nice? And why aren't more stories being told? And I found this, which ironically is on a, a Swedish website of all things. You know, farmers are the true COVID heroes. And the thought occurred to me, you know, wow, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it change our world um, in this country if we could just get 60% of South Africans to, to tell this story? Um, and if we did, my, my final parting slide for you um, uh, is, is, is a, a simple and, and rather a childish idea, but I think it's a good one, you know, that I think there is potentially my, my, my message for you, hopefully, is that if we can use this moment, this crucial moment in, in, in our lives, coming out of COVID, coming out of a lockdown, a moment when, when people and decision makers and people with some power and consumers with power are at a very heightened stage of their, of their growth and awareness, we, we might be able to use this as the moment to highlight the value, the real value of agriculture and farming in the food chain and in society. Um, and we may just have a fairy tale uh, ending. Um, and that is that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me, Jim. Brandon, thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I can only say this, which, which is something that, uh, that, uh, that's hitting everybody hard. Firstly, uh, the poverty levels in our country 
is going to actually take away the opportunities that should be there for we have a young population. We've got so many young people, the opportunities must be there for them. And the second thing that was for me very insightful is that we know that the consumer determines what the farmers must produce and that the whole cycle and the whole value chain of agriculture to the consumer is extremely important for us to make a reasonable impact and an impact of, of, of on, our, on, on the growth of our economy and producing the right products, uh, the exportation of those products, uh, as well as making sure that everybody in South Africa has some food to eat. Thank you very much for, for showing us that we farmers something and sometimes sell ourselves short in the sense that we don't make sure that the population of South Africa know what we're actually doing and how we go about it. The farmers of South Africa are really a resilient lot of people, hardworking people, and that includes our employees and everybody else that's involved in agriculture. We've got a country where 60% uh, of the people are urbanized, the affordability of food is very important and that we look into the value chain and we'll have to find the weak links and do something about them. It's also our responsibility to be involved in it. Thank you very much again. Uh, I think Christo has, uh, has received quite a few questions. I'm going to give him an opportunity to pose those to you and uh, then we sure. will move on. Thank you, Christo. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, Brendan, thanks for a very insightful uh, presentation. And it's very interesting, your last observation, that um, uh, so few people all over the world are cheering for the farmers. Uh, and one would expect that farmers would be regarded as the true heroes. Even here in South Africa, farmers have contributed during the uh, very strict lockdown regulatory period towards um, food aid and all kinds of other uh, uh, types of aid just to keep communities going. But this is a very interesting observation from Kathy. What she says is that, um, yes, uh, young people are active in a lot of areas, in a lot of sectors. But what is happening in agriculture is just the opposite. What we see that we've got an aging uh, group of uh, people that are interested in farming and not a lot of young people. And maybe young people are very active in social media and uh, because they're not interested in agriculture, uh, that's why they do not actually uh, grasp the importance of farmers in terms of providing food to the nation. And uh, that's a trend all over the world. Perhaps uh, what uh, would you say, what can one do to get young people really interested in the agriculture sector and more young people interested in following a career in agriculture? Yeah, I, I look, it's an excellent question. And I, I mean, I can tell you, uh, there's a simple answer. The simple answer is that, uh, that people in general, but definitely the younger generations are, are worse in this respect, are so disconnected from the food chain. Uh, you know, when you live in, in cities now, the, there are young people who, who just have no idea where their food comes from. They, 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 they haven't thought about it. They're not made to think about it. Um, and that's where the education thing comes in. You know, we, I think we take it for granted that, um, that everybody understands the food chain, that everybody understands that carrots don't, aren't supposed to look perfectly uniform. You know, um, but we don't teach children that. So our children are increasingly the urbanized child or the urbanized generation is just increasingly separated from the source of their food. And the answer lies, the, 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 the cure, um, you know, we, we, we can put plasters on if we want, but the cure would lie in trying to change an education system to teach children about how connected they need to be to their food. Where does their food come from? So there are various projects that we know of um, in, in urban environments. Again, I'm, I'm only using Cape Town as an example, but something like the city farm here. If you go and you look at, at the, the urban farming projects in places like Germany, um, I'm very au fait with what happens in, in Berlin. It's extraordinary. Um, you know, every day there are children in plots of land all over the city of Berlin watching vegetables grow out the ground. 
so that they understand as they grow up how important that farming sector is. We've done the opposite here. We've just, you know, we've uprooted all of the, the vegetable patches and put McDonald's there. You know? So children think that food comes from a plastic wrapper. Um, and, I, and I think that really is the, that would be my solution, would be let's put a long-term solution in play here and let's try and change the education system to teach people, children, more about where their food comes from. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's vital. Yeah. You know? Thank you. I think AgriSA has a very specific role to play and um, to make contact with schools and perhaps send little videos or send a seat pack to schools and get kids also involved in agriculture in some way or another. I think we live in a technology area where young kids are so obsessed with this technology tool in their hands. And even adults nowadays don't even chat to each other. Everyone is fixated with uh, the cell phone at hand or the computer in front of them. And uh, this is a dangerous path. I think we really have to connect, disconnect ourselves from technology from time to time and focus on the real world that exists all over the show. So thank you very much. I think we have run out of time at this point in time. Pierre, back to you. Anything in addition? Thank you, Christo. Uh, I think uh, we most probably can forward other questions to Brandon, if, if, if need be, if they, we've got lots of questions. Brandon, thank you very much. Very insightful. It also, it also showed the responsibility we have as farmers. We've got a social responsibility too, uh, to be able to make a success of our country. Thank you very much again. We've really enjoyed that. Ladies it's and gentlemen, pleasure, now. Okay. Okay, Brandon, if you wanted to say something. I just said it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me, and uh, I hope you have a, a good rest of your conference, James. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, well, the next part, a bit of our, uh, uh, on our agenda is an advert that will be played before we move on to the next speaker.